Friday, yeah? Woo! We've got two fantastic seniors that are going to talk about their research today. I'm going to start with Olivia Waco. Yes, please come in and have a seat. The food smells good. I'm hungry. It really smells good. So Olivia Wake Up, we're excited to hear what she has to say. I'm not going to read her title because I'm going to let her do it. So welcome, Olivia. Thanks, Linda. So you guys can read it, but it's from the Iapetus to the Atlantic. So I am really interested in looking at the Eastern Blue Ridge cover sequence. I just wanted to start off really broadly and show you guys a picture of North America and the Atlantic Ocean. As we know with Earth's plate tectonics, um, these haven't been here forever, but it feels like it sometimes, right? Um, but actually the Iapetus Ocean was here, it was the precursor to the Atlantic, and Laurentia was a supercontinent that preceded North America. And this is just a brief timeline of Virginia's tectonic history. So Virginia specifically where Central Bay, Central Modern, Central Virginia is today. Um, there's been, you can really see the onset of both Iapetan rifting all the way to Atlantic drifting, which makes it a really cool study area. The first instances of Iapetan rifting, there's thought to be two different pulses of this, occurred around 600 million years ago. You're gonna see the approximate signs on all of these because there's really not great constraints on all of these tectonic events. And then somewhere between 500 and 600 million years ago, around 550 most likely, um, is when you start to see the Iapetus open and then also this passive margin setting, very similar to what we see today with the Atlantic. And then between 500 million years ago and 200 million years ago, there's the onset of Deconian orogeny, the Cadian orogeny, and then the onset of the final assemblage of Pangaea before we finally get to Atlantic rifting. So there's a lot going on between these two events. And then right after Atlantic rifting, the Atlantic Ocean opens to where we are today with a modern passive margin setting. So in order to see um, this whole like rift to drift uh, transition, we wanna go to an area that was once overlain by the Iapetus, AKA Central Virginia. So that's why we chose the Simeon Quadrangle. It's in the Eastern Blue Ridge Geologic Province and yeah, it's just outside Charlottesville. But first we should probably understand and get a better idea of what the regional geology is here in the Blue Ridge. Um, Simeon is actually in this rectangle right here and it makes up the eastern limb. So the Blue Ridge province is made up of this huge structure about 250 meters or miles long called the Blue Ridge Anticlinorium. At its core is this Grunvillian basement complex that's 1 to 1.2 billion years old. It's a suite of gneisses and granites. And then on each limb, the eastern and western limb, there's a series of metasedimentary and igneous units um, that nonconformally lie over the basement. On the eastern side, we'll see the Catoctin and Abington group exposed. So you might be wondering, well, why did we focus here and collect our samples here as opposed to other areas in the Blue Ridge? And the reason we did this is because in 1994, Nick Evans came out with a map um, that had these felsic metavolcanic units, the metadacite and quartz diorite porphyry layers. They're highlighted here on the right of the figure. Felsic metavolcanic units are super important because they typically include this uh, accessory mineral zircon, which is a nesosilicate. And zircons are really important because they're usually a great mineral that we can use to date things. If we're able to date um, these units using zircon, we'd be able to provide a time constraint for rocks in this area. There's been a lot of research and geochronology done on the Western Blue Ridge, but there's been a lot less on the Eastern Blue Ridge. So these outcrops are like a really promising area for us because we could add more data points to the whole Blue Ridge. To understand what kind of rocks there are exposed in Simeon, there's two major groups, the Catoctin Formation and the Evington Group. The Catoctin is around 570 to 550 million years old. It's the series of subaerial and subaqueous lava flows that are associated with the opening of the Iapetus Ocean. The most prominent unit is the Catoctin Greenstone. This happened when the lava flows cooled to form a basalt. They were later metamorphosed. There's then these um, metasedimentary units, the metasiltstones and metaarcos in the Catoctin. These happened when the exposed highlands got eroded. And then these were deposited between the lava flows after each eruption. So that's why they're kind of stacked and sandwiched in between the Catoctin greenstone. 
Next, we have the Evington group. This is a suite of uh, low-grade metamorphic units, and these are pretty much all associated with post-rift conditions. So this is probably after the Iapetus had already opened. So a lot of series of uh, like metasedimentary rocks. And then here, um, you can see that the geometry is a little bit different. It's like this very thin layer, and it looks like very straight, like across the cross section. Um, that's the metadacite, one of the felsic metavolcanic units. It's only about 15 meters thick um, in its exposure, and it's like a very dark, fine grained rock, according to Evans. We then get some more uh, metasedimentary rocks, and then the next felsic metavolcanic unit, the quartz porphyry. This is similar, it's even thinner, probably only around 10 meters thick, and it has a very similar geometry. This is followed by the next few metasedimentary layers. And then the youngest is the Everona limestone, which is interbedded with a graphite slate layer. Um, and this is actually the youngest unit in all of the Blue Ridge Anticlinorium. So I'm really interested in trying to date the opening of the Iapetus Ocean in southeastern Laurentia. That's where the study site is. And then I also want to understand the depositional environment and formation conditions of the Easter, Eastern Blue Ridge cover sequence. So this summer is when I really kicked off my research. Um, I was part of the structural geology group here this summer called B to the Seventh. We all had projects like ranging all across the Blue Ridge from William Mary's Highland um, down to the Blue Ridge Tunnel, which is the figure here on the right. Um, and my goals for this summer were to collect all my samples, do all my field work, and really make sure I had everything ready to go for my analyses. Pretty much the theme of this um, field work this summer was um, I'd be really excited looking at the geologic map, trying to plot my traverses based on where the outcrops were. And then in reality, we'd get there, and it turns out that most of my study site is this really dense pine, pine plantation, which made things pretty difficult in the summer months. And there's really no great outcrops here. Um, and then on top of it, just the geometry of the units I was looking for, since they're dikes, um, they're vertical, which means there's not a huge outcrop like going across, that means that it makes it even more challenging to find exactly where they are, but it was a fun challenge. These are the three outcrops where samples were taken for analysis. So these were the three units that are outcrops that we were most confident in that went along with Evan's description of their location and also just their rock characteristics. Um, these were the ones that we will end up taking for the geochronological analyses, the geochemistry results, and also the petrological analysis. But first, I want to give a brief introduction about geochronology for those of you that might not know. It's basically just dating any mineral and figuring out its age. Specifically, we use uranium lead geochronology. That's probably one of the most popular techniques right now. Over time, uranium um, is radioactive and it decays into lead. And at pretty much any given time, you can measure the percentage of uranium and the relative percentage of lead. And that's the parent daughter ratio. And that and from that information, you can get the age. The most common lead isotope equations are listed here, and that's kind of how you can denote the parent-daughter ratio from them. Another really important technique is, uh, or for geochronology is understanding closure temperatures. Um, highlighted in red are the zircon and apatite closure temperatures. You can note that zircon has one of the highest closure temperatures at around 900, and apatite is around um, 400 to 500, a little bit more in the middle of things. And closure temperature is very important to help us understand crystallization histories of minerals. So at any time that the mineral had reached that temperature, that can give us really valuable information for its age. So the next few slides, um, unfortunately, William & Mary doesn't have like the geochronology techniques and laboratories on site. So we were really fortunate to go to the University of Texas at Austin, me, Hannah, and Nyla. Um, and the next few slides are showing kind of the methodology we did to pre-process our samples for geochronology. The first step is we have this huge bag of our sample. We put it in the top of the rock crusher. It grinds and crushes the sample down into small pebbles and out comes kind of a homogeneous looking pebble structure. And then next is another la or another machine in the room, which is a disc mill. And this really grinds the sample into a fine powder. Next is a picture of Hannah. So you'll take that fine powder um, and put it into the top of the Gemini shaker table. 
And this is just a machine that separates materials based on density. It kind of uses water as an agent for that. Um, since we're really interested in basically whittling down the size of our sample to only get the zircons and apatites, we are only interested in collecting the heavy minerals. You can kind of see the minerals, the heavy minerals collecting here. They're the darker in color ones in that crevice right there. So we collected those. And then after that was done, we took the heavy minerals and we wanted to try to separate them into magnet, magnetic and non-magnetic material. This was kind of the first step we did of a few to do this. Oh, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> um, this is a hand magnet right here and you just take it and separate them out, um, magnetic and non-magnetic material. The reason that we did that is because there's actually a very precise instrument that we use, the frond magnetic separator to do this. But the input to put the sample in is right here in this little tube. It's pretty small. So if you had a really large volume of sample, that would probably take multiple days and we didn't have the time to do that. So that's why we led with the um, hand magnet. But basically you, you drop the sample in the tube and then out comes this non-magnetic versus magnetic tubs. And we were interested in keeping the non-magnetic material because that's again, where the zircon and apatites would be. Next, we got to picking. This is a petrographic microscope, the figure on the left. And then underneath is when we started picking using tweezers, finding each individual appetite and zircon grain. So unlike Hannah and Nyla, I did not have as many zircons. Um, so this is a picture of a lot of appetites, which is also very interesting. And there, yeah, so there's a lot of appetites in the sample. So I got really lucky. And then next, the final step that we really participated in before we let like the grad students take over um, was marking each individual zircon and appetite grain. Um, this is to kind of prepare the machine for ablation and also to make sure, kind of gives you a double check to see like, oh, is this really a zircon and is this really an appetite? Um, and also give you a number of how many you have in total before ablating. And this is just an image of the LAICPMS machine, which is the technique that we used for geocon. This is kind of, it kind of looks like an overwhelming slide. Um, this is the laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry process. That's why they call it LAICPMS. Uh, and basically the main takeaway is that this machine just ablates particles. So you have the sample in this airtight sample chamber and you have this laser beam that comes down and ablates it. So it'll look something like the zircon on the left with these holes in it. And then it kind of creates this aerosol in this uh, airtight sample chamber once it's ablated. And then it takes these ions from it, the uranium and the lead, into the actual machine. So it's extracting that from the zircon. So before I get to my geocron results, I just wanted to give you more of an insight as to what these rocks actually were, which we figured out more from the geochemical and petrological results. So the first sample is OW3. Um, keep in mind that this was supposed to be a metadacite, so a felsic metavolcanic rock. Those of you that have had petrology can probably see that this probably isn't a volcanic rock, but I want to point you in the direction of the fabric. So there's this primary fabric that kind of goes this way, then there's another fabric that kind of goes this way, um, and that's actually called the crenulation cleavage, which is super interesting. Um, that means that there's been one primary foliation and then it's been folded again. That's not super characteristic, yeah. So that kind of tells you that it might be a sedimentary or a metasedimentary material. And then you can also see kind of like these, these class, they're not really interlocking like phenocrysts or crystals. They're definitely like kind of class and this is very micaceous. So that all together kind of gave me a sense of this is not exactly what Evans had in mind. I got further evidence of this because there's actually a detrital zircon that we found in this thin section, um, which is really exciting. And for those of you that know, um, a detrital zircon is actually one that's been weathered and eroded away, and it's pretty much only present in sedimentary materials. So it won't give you any information on the crystallization age, but typically gives you some more information on the provenance or where it was from. My OW7 and my OW8 um, rocks were pretty similar. They're the same rock. Um, but based on the last image and this one, they look pretty different, right? Like they're not the same rock. They're not even the same type of rock. Um, so this is actually an igneous rock and it has a very um, sodium rich uh, matrix that's been like recrystallized and broken up phenocrysts. And then the big 
uh, green in the middle, middle, middle is enethylene, um, which is really um, characteristic of sodium rich rocks. And this doesn't really happen with any quartz. So in these thin sections, there's a lot of clads, there's a lot of sanidine, a lot of sodium rich material, and not really um, any quartz or anything like that. So this is a total alkali silica chart. Um, and just to keep in mind that a metadacite would probably plot in the dacite area, and instead it's here. But what we know now is that OW3 isn't even an igneous rock, so it probably shouldn't even be used on this table. Um, it's not a tracheandesite, it's a micaceous metasilstone. But since that's what we originally thought, we plotted it to show the difference. And then these up here are super surprising findings for us. So OW7 and OW8 have such a high Na2O and K2O content. Um, we would have expected them to be more of an andesite, um, but they're phonolites, which are very interesting rocks and pretty peculiar, which also helps us understand why there is so much plage and sodium rich material. So now for the geochronology results. Um, for OW3, we use the tridal zircon geochronology, and this is a Concordia plot, which can kind of tell you the span of ages for your um, zircons. Ideally, there would be like one population all centered around one age. However, there's a pretty large spread of ages, and that kind of tells you that these were probably the tridal. Um, and then, so this is kind of a visualization of how old the grains are for OW3, the largest peak being at 1120 MA, um, and they're in 40 million year bins. But does this make sense? So just as a reminder, this sample is supposed to be stratigraphically above the Catoctin and definitely above the Grenvillian basement. That's where the Catoctin would plot, and that's where the Grenvillian basement would plot. So that also kind of tells us that it probably should be over here, but since the grains are all the way over here, that means that they aren't telling us the crystallization history. They would be a lot younger if they were not detrital, but since they're detrital, they tell us more about the provenance. And then OW7 and OW8 were ran using Appetite, um, and there's a slightly different diagram that we use for those, it's called the Terra Wasserberg uh, Concordia diagram. Uh, it's pretty much the same concept, but Instead, they're like trying to find a whole ratio instead of each individual grain. And for these, we found that they're 158 um, million years old. So that's a lot younger than the Iapetus. Um, and so this is probably associated with the Atlantic. A very similar age is yielded for OW8, 162. We can conclude based on thin section and this that these are the same kind of rock. So these were mapped incorrectly, right? This is a pretty big finding. We couldn't find the date for the Iapetus, but this is pretty much just as good because we found that this is wrong and we can use this for like further dating. Um, it's actually a micaceous metasiltstone unit. So it's not meta-igneous, it's sedimentary. And then the porphyry unit is a phonolite dike, um, which has a very interesting mineral assemblage. And then also OW7 and OW8 are associated with Atlantic rifting as opposed to Iapetan rifting. My next steps, I have to go out in the field again. I really want to understand the geometry and the structure and the stratigraphic relations of these phonolite dikes. Um, and then we also want to continue interpreting these geochronology ages. They're not exactly what we expected and we need more training on like how to interpret them, um, create more figures and kind of figure out the stratigraphic relations. Thank you.